Hello. I see there's three of you on here. That's great. Um, to the left side, there's a chat box if at any time you want to ask questions um, or just let me know who's listening. We're probably going to wait like three or four more minutes just to see if a few more people can get on. Um, again, this is going to be recorded anyways. But. So just give us just a minute. But there is that chat button on the left-hand corner. It's a blue. It's like a text box. If at any time you want to ask questions or let me know who's on here, that would be great. Hi, Kelly. You just texted me, so I know you're on here. I'm going to wait probably just a few more minutes, just let a few more people get on. I know some people are having a little bit of struggles. <laughs> yes, you can text me questions. That's fine. <laughs> For those of you that missed it, I said earlier, if you put like your cursor over the left hand side, there's a text box or a chat box. If you want to ask any questions during this, you can ask any questions you would like. I'll try to cover as much as possible. Um, and if you can't find the, chat, the text box, you can text me because Kelly is. <laughs> okay, a lot of you are saying that you are on your phone, so that's fine. If you have questions, I'll try and keep my phone next to me, um, and you can um, message me on the Facebook group, or um, if you have a number, you can text me. Um, but I'm going to start. Uh, bear with me. This is my first um, 
YouTube where I don't have students like talking back at me, so it's kind of weird. And I have dogs and they're kind of angry right now. It's been a hard day. Um, but first I would like to thank all of you guys for joining me and for those of you who are going to be watching um, later. I hope this video is beneficial for you. Um, I kind of jotted down some notes of things that people are wanting me to cover um, and I hope I can cover it all for you. Um, if not, I have um, made videos previously um, to refer you back to because I don't have a live model um, right now um, and hopefully I can, hopefully we can um, clear up any questions and hopefully we can continue to do this because I think it's, it's a great thing for continuing education. Um, let me check. Okay, no more comments. Okay. Um, so first thing, um, we're going to talk about blade size and selection. Um, why, what, how. Um, we're going to talk about the magic eraser and how to use it. We're going to talk about stretching techniques. I know that was probably one of the main things that you wanted to talk about, and I have made a video of that, and I'll link it to this video after um, because I don't have a live model to show you. Um, so I'll link it in enhancement session, what to do and how to curb your strokes. Um, I know there are a few questions on how to cover color theory. Um, and for that, I'm going to uh, link a video that Monica did. Um, it was previously, it was like back in May. Um, so a lot of the newer students probably didn't see the video. So I'm going to link that video. And then Jen Boyd is also doing a little pictorial for healed results to kind of help um, us out with the healed results as well. Um, so jumping into it, um, again, if you have questions, text me, comment, um, anything. I have my phone right here, so um, if you have questions, just let me know. Um, but I just want to talk about the four goals of microblading. Um, when you, and I think this is one of the things that sets Everlasting apart, is people comment on what, how Everlasting brows are different from everyone else's. Obviously, aren't we teach hair stroke patterns and um, but for, for the majority, you have four goals um, when you're trying to microblade someone. Um, it's supposed to be an enhancement. It's not supposed to be something where you change their brows um, and someone's going to look at them and be like, whoa, what happened to your eyebrows? Um, um, so you want to enhance the shape um, and you want to make sure that it's enhancing their facial features. So that's goal number one. You don't want to do anything that's going to change um, their face in not something that's going to enhance it. You always want to make them prettier. I always think of makeup, um, how it's supposed to enhance everyone's features. It's not supposed to hide or camouflage something. Um, the next thing is, this, is the size. You want to make sure that the size is um, comfortable for their face. It's not overbearing. It's not too big. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of people come in and they want these Kim Kardashian brows. Um, but Kim Kardashian brows might not look the best on them. So your goals there for one and two are size and shape, just enhancing the size and the shape. Um, and then the color. Color you want to make sure that you're matching closest to their natural eyebrow hair color. Um, and that gets kind of tricky. You kind of have to mix and match colors, and especially with our new Everlasting line. Um, and again, I'll link the video for color. Um, but your goal is to match their natural eyebrow hair color. Um, but like exhibit A, I have really blonde eyebrows and I don't color in my eyebrows blonde. Um, so I have to be committed to tinting um, or continuing to color them in because I'm going to have an awkward shower, shadow. Um, remember that you're implanting pigment into your epidermal cells. You're not doing anything with the hairs. I wish I could be magically like empowering and be able to like target the hairs with my pigment, but I can't. Um, so remember you're just trying to color match those hairs. Um, and then your next goal is to follow the hair pattern. I think this is the biggest thing, um, especially when I'm teaching, this is like my biggest like you must follow the hair pattern. And if you have been a student of mine, you'll know that I tell you that you cannot ever create a barcode eyebrow or a fence, or um, I will probably hunt you down. Um, because that's not that's not pretty. It's not natural. It's not um, something that's going to complement their hairs. So you're wanting to make sure that you are following the natural hair pattern. If their hairs are growing up, if their hairs are growing down, um, if they're an Asian, if they're a European, if they're Asian and European and an uplift, you follow that no matter what. 
Um, and then the thickness. So this is going to lead us to our blade sizes. Um, you're going to want to match the actual eyebrow hair thickness. So if you have all of these goals in your microblading in mind, you're going to be able to create the most natural appearance and the natural result. Um, so if someone has super fine hair, you're not going to want to use your biggest blade, and we'll get in more detail of, of blade sizes and stuff like that. Let me check. No comments yet. Oh. Okay, Bernadette, I will answer your question in just a little bit. Um, so you'll want to be able to match the hair pattern um, as best as possible. So Jen put up a post a couple days ago. I don't know if you all saw it, but I thought it was great. Um, and it talked about what blade sizes to use. And it, it, is, it always is really kind of confusing of how to use blades because we have so much selection. But I think that's the beauty of Everlasting is we do have so much selection because eyebrows are never a one-size-fits-all. Um, I don't know if you've, you've probably noticed that now um, with working on clients is that every brow is going to be different. Every brow is going to be thicker. Every brow is going to be thinner. Every brow is going to have less hair or more hair. So it just kind of depends. Um, so with your blade sizes, um, and I'm going to, this is going to be like kind of blade sizes for dummies, um, just so I can teach it to you all brand new again. Um, so I'm sorry if I'm reiterating things and you're like, Sarah, come on, like I get to the point, but I just want to make sure I'm covering everything. Um, so your blade sizes, first off, we have, um, our C blade, sorry, my dogs, um, I have my C blades. Um, and then I have my U blade. And when we talk about it in um, your courses, we talk about the C blade being a more of a beginner blade. It's more of your most popularly used blade as you're starting out. Um, and it's uh, shaped like a slant. Um, I do have my whiteboard here. Um. Maggie. Okay. okay, so we have our slanted blade. Sorry, I'm not an artist on whiteboards. Um, but we have our slanted blade, which is called a C blade. Um, our C blades come in sizes uh, 7, 9, 10, 11. Nope, not 10. 11, 12, and 14. Um, and... So why would I use a 7 versus a 14? Um, one analogy, I'm really big on analogies, one analogy I really like to think of is, um, and I'm not sure if this is from Melissa or Monica, I think it's a little bit of both, but thank you guys for this analogy, um, is it, you're trying to park a semi versus like a compact car. Um, it's going to be a lot harder for you to curb in the semi than it is to curb in or park the, the compact car. Um, so, um, up on Jen's post, she said, thin brows, you want to use blade size 7 to 9. Um, 7 being the smallest and 9 being the largest. So, if I have a teeny, teeny little brow, um, you want to be able to have room to curve. Um, and what I mean by that, if I have just a small little space, okay, if you look at this eyebrow I just drew here, this is this tiny little brow, and I need to be able to control my strokes enough that I can come up and I can curve my stroke. I don't want to be able to use a big, a big pin, like a 14, and not being able to control it. So see, I'm coming, and oh, oh, oops. Sorry, now I'm really going to have to use my magic eraser. Okay, um, so if you have a, a, a thin brow, um, you're going to want to use about 7 or 9. You have a medium-sized brow. Um, for me, I think mine eyebrows considered a medium-sized brow. Um, you could use, either use a 9, 11, or a 12. Um, and the reason there's margins is I think about it is comfortability. Um, when you're a student, when you're first learning, it is a little bit harder for you to curve your strokes or to be able to have control of that blade. 
So if you feel a little bit uncomfortable, maybe go down to a nine, and then you can work your way up to the 12 as you get more comfortable and you have more control. And then the thick brow, um, like the Kim Kardashian, like, I mean, like thick brow right here, you could use a 12 to a 14. Um, the main concerns that you have when choosing a blade pin size is are you going to be able to control it? Okay, so are you going to be able to start and stop where you want to? Um, and are you going to be able to uh, the, use the amount of pressure that you want to? Um, if you're using a seven blade on a brow that is really big, um, it's going to be harder for you to apply the even amount of pressure that you need to throughout the entire stroke because it's really, really long. So in that case, I would suggest you to just bump it up a little bit, maybe go for a nine or 11, um, if you feel like you can control it, of course. I would never choose a seven just because I'm worried. Um, practice, sorry, my hair's sticking out. <laughs> um, practice on your fake skin first if you feel uncomfortable. Um, but it's also working smarter, not harder. If you're using a seven blade on a Kim Kardashian brow, um, you're gonna spend a lot more time than you would on a Kim Kardashian brow using a 12 or a 14. Um, so make sure, this, just look at the size of the brow um, and then ask yourself, what size of blade would you feel comfortable with? Are you going to be able to control it? Because um, that's the biggest thing. If you feel like you can't control it and you can't create proper curves, then maybe go down a size until you've gotten a little bit more experience. But I would never um, choose a seven just because you feel a little bit uncomfortable. You can definitely go to a nine and bump yourself up to an 11. Um, and then we have a 0.18 and a 0.25. And you just want to look at the hair um, as it naturally is. Um, do they have really, really fine hair? Um, or do they have really thick or coarse hair? They have really fine, fine baby hairs. Like it's almost like Bella's hair. Like you look at them and you can't really see their eyebrow. Then I would go with a 0.18 because remember, my goal is to match their hair. So if I'm matching their hair and their hair is really, really fine, but I'm creating these really thick microblading strokes, they're not going to coincide very well. It's not going to look natural. Um, but if they have a coarser hair and you're choosing a 0.18, the, those strokes aren't necessarily going to show up. The 0.18 isn't really going to be seen. The coarseness of the hair is going to kind of wash it out. Um, let me see if there's any questions. Nope, no questions yet. Okay. Um, so I hope that makes sense a little bit more. Um, the U blade is, it's an awesome blade um, if you are trying to curve. I, I, when I use it, I can create the most beautiful curves as possible. Um, you are a little bit more limited in the U blade because currently Everlasting only has a 0.18. Um, so it creates a very thin hair stroke and that's why it was the most popular when microblading first started because it created this, this thin, thin hair stroke. Um, but your U-Blade, um, and I will make a video of how to, how to use it, um, but it, it's really good for students who are having a hard time curving their hair strokes. And I'll go over um, kind of how to hold your hand piece um, so that it will help you um, kind of curve a little bit better as well. Um, but as far as blade selection, just remember your goals. Um, you're trying to match their hair thickness, their, hair, um, their eyebrow hair pattern, and their natural brow width. Okay, um, so remember that analogy that if you're, you can't, if say my 14 blade is my semi, um, and I have this tiny, tiny little eyebrow, I can't properly park my semi in this tiny, tiny little eyebrow. So I, I hope that makes sense right there. Um, so going on to curving your hair strokes, um, and I, I think this comes a lot with practice. Um, if you haven't done so already, I would encourage you get, to get back to your fake skin. Um, I have mine right here. Okay, it's brand new. I'm, I'm ready to go. Um, so I'd encourage you to get back onto your fake skin practice, um, especially because um, I'm traveling a lot teaching. I don't get to work on clients as much as I would like to, except for this month I haven't taught a lot. I'm kind of bored. Um, just kidding. Um, 
but I would encourage you to get back to your fake skin practice. Um, this is where your technique can really come from. You can kind of see your hair stroke patterns. You can see what's going wrong. You can see if you're crossing your strokes. Um, I know a few girls posted today that they get kind of lost in translation, and we'll talk about that. Um, but being able to perfect it on this, that way um, when you do get onto the real skin, you don't have um, just this. This client doesn't bleed. She doesn't complain and say she's in pain, and there isn't any hairs. So yes, it, it's easier here, but you can get a lot of your techniques here and transfer them over onto um, your real life client. Okay, so going into curving your strokes, um, I think a lot of it is uh, hand placement of your blade. Um, and so I have my blade right here, and I did make a video of this for you that I'll link in the um, in the comments, or I'll just link it in the Facebook group. Um, but learning that it's never going to be in your wrist. Um, I'm sure you've watched several microblading videos at this time of um, amazing artists like Tina Davies and um, Rita Roma, and um, if you'll you'll realize that it's never in the wrist. Um, but one trick that I learned from Jen, who is my best friend, I love you, Jen, um, is holding, uh, well, and I said this in your video, um, but remembering that your handpiece is no longer a pencil. I know in training we have you start out with a pencil because we can't give you a blade and like tell you, you know, have fun, good luck. Um, but I hold my pencil like this, like I'm just, you know, writing. I need to hold my blade straight up and down. And one thing that changed my microblading was the way that I held it. So, um, and I'll, again, it's in a video and it, it's with an iPhone 7 and it's amazing. But um, is I'm pinching my thumb and my um, middle finger together. And then my pointer finger here is kind of assisting. Um, and knowing that your curves are never going to come from your wrist. Your curves are going to come from your sliding motion in here. So I challenge you to go and try and hold your handpiece like this. It will feel very, very awkward to you at first. But this really is what helped improve my strokes and my curves. Um, and I owe this all to Jen Boyd. So thank you, Jen. Um, and I hope you don't mind I'm sharing your secret. Um, but holding your handpiece like this and then remembering that your curving is in a motion movement like this. It's never in your wrist. Okay. And again, I have a video of this to demonstrate because I know this isn't the best quality here. Um, let me see if there's any questions. Oh, someone just asked just how much I charge for microblading, but I don't think they're watching. <laughs> um, the next thing um, that a lot of people asked about um, was how to stretch the skin. Um, and I did make a video of this as well. Um, but I think one thing also, the way that I hold my handpiece now is I also have my pinky free. Okay, um, so no matter what, I'm always stretching with my pinky, and then I have another hold. Um, you need to have a three-point hold on the brow at all times. Um, and again, it's in my video, so it's going to be a lot easier to explain. But one of the biggest mistakes that I see students make is they're not holding the skin tight or taut enough. Um, if the skin, if you are blading, I'm not, I'm going to use the opposite side, sorry guys, I don't really want to blade my eyebrow. But if I'm blading and my skin's moving up with my blade, I'm not holding the skin tight enough. Um, so wherever you are, you need to make sure that you're holding the skin taut in the place that you are microblading. A lot of times I see students holding skin taut here, but they're microblading here, but it's not holding this skin area taut. So making sure that you're holding one, two and then I always hold three with my pinky and I, it's it's demonstrated better in my video that I'll link afterwards. Um, but no matter what you do, make sure that you're holding the area that you're working top because if you're microblading here, 
but you're holding the skin out here taut, this area is still gonna move. And if at any time your skin is moving up, like up while you're microblading, the skin is not held hot enough. Um, and you won't be hearing that scratch, scratch, scratch. Um, also making sure that you are holding um, your hand piece right. And again, this is in my video and I, I hate to be like repetitive, um, but whenever you set down your microblade, you want to make sure, and I always kind of ask myself, are all my needles touching at the exact same time? Okay, that assures that I'm going to get that stroke, 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 and that scratch, scratch, scratch noise, um, and I'm going to make a proper stroke. Um, if I'm off to the side or like slanted up, or maybe I'm like this and only two needles are touching, um, if only two needles are touching, I'm essentially kind of slicing, not scratching. So again, setting down your blade on the skin before you do the stroke and asking yourself, are all my needles touching the skin? Um, if the answer is yes, then you can continue. Um, so, and my video will demonstrate the stretching techniques. But I think the biggest thing is making sure that you're comfortable with where you're at. Um, if you're doing a stroke, for instance, for example, when I first started, my strokes underneath the arch were the hardest, um, which makes sense because it's it's more of a fleshier area. It moves easier. Um, so for me, the biggest thing was getting up and out of my seat and kind of coming in front of my client, holding and then and then microblading there. Um, and I'll demonstrate that in my video. Um, any questions yet? Nope, not yet. Kelly, do you have any questions? I know you said you wanted to text me, so. Oh, let me see here really quick. Um, okay, sorry guys, just checking. Um, and a lot of, um, in a lot of the case studies I've been getting recently, um, and just in general with what I've been seeing on the group, is I see a lot of students um, making a lot of strokes um, and it probably doesn't make much sense when I email you back and tell you to make it more of a more meaningful stroke. So I'm going to kind of explain um, what I mean by that. Um, a more meaningful stroke means I'd rather you practice on your fake skin creating one stroke, um, wiping off, and then practicing going back in the exact same stroke. Because a lot of you at first, your depths aren't deep enough. Um, so you go and you're like, oh, well, I need to make it darker, so I'm just going to add more strokes. Um, so I'd rather you go back in and practice on your fake skin here, um, going in and making a stroke, wiping off, and then practicing going back in the exact same stroke just to kind of open it up a little bit more. You can go into the same exact stroke, I say up to three to four times as long as the skin isn't compromised and you're not getting a lot of bleeding at all. Um, so making sure that you're, and what I mean by more meaningful strokes is I'd rather you have less strokes that are the correct depth than a bunch of tiny little strokes that are not deep enough at all. Um, so I would challenge you um, to, of course, get back onto your fake skin, but um, when you have your client tomorrow or next week or whenever you have, um, remember your placement of your blade, your all needles, your stretching, which is gonna be in the video, your hearing the sound, because if you don't hear the sound, you're not implementing pigment as deep as it should be. Um, and then if you have to, don't be afraid to go back in the exact same stroke. Of course, I would remember to practice on that on the first, on the first time. Um, so um, try and get some more meaningful strokes in there. Less is going to be more for this um, as long as you have correct strokes. So a lot of the case studies I'm seeing is the strokes are really superficial, which is extremely, extremely normal. Um, I'm going to be really real with you. It, it probably took me um 20 to 25 clients um to be able to feel like i was getting the correct depth and then honestly 30 like anywhere from 30 to 50 clients um after my 50 client mark i was like okay this like my retention was finally coming back the way that i wanted it to be because i was understanding more um the pressure but just remember if the skin is moving at all when you're creating your stroke 
your skin's not held tight enough. Um, and you're probably, for that reason, you could be going deep enough, but it could be a little bit more jagged or you could not be going deep at all. Um, so focus on that the next time you are using your client. Um, let's see. Uh, let's go over uh, the magic eraser. Um, the Magic Eraser is an amazing product um, that Everlasting came out with um, for the removal of strokes. Um, and the way that we use it, I'll demonstrate kind of how to use it um, uh, with um, my thing here. Um, but the one thing I want you to know with the Magic Eraser um, is to not use it as a um, handicap. I think a lot of students are nervous. Of course you're nervous. This is a face. This is like a real human, be human being. Sorry, my dog. Um, they're, I mean, they're going to bleed. They're going to be a little bit uncomfortable. Um, but don't use it as a handicap to not microblade until you receive your magic eraser. Yes, of course, it's awesome to have on hand, and I think it's absolutely an amazing product. But don't feel like you can't microblade without it. Um, because that wasn't a thing when I started microblading or when Jen started microblading. Um, so remember that it is it is okay. Um, but just aim for, you know, trying um, to not make those mistakes. As long as you are focusing, and I, I think some students get a little bit lost in translation. We'll talk about that. Um, and even if you need to, um, a little trick I use is if you need to dip your um, pigment in and just tap, 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 tap. You're not microblading and just add a little bit of pigment and say, would that stroke look good right there if I did a stroke there? Um, you don't have to microblade. You can just tap in a little bit of pigment or you could use a toothpick. Um, just, you know, tap in just a little bit of pigment right there and look at the stroke and say, you know, would this be a good stroke um, for me to place there? Um, also, and I just got off topic of magic eraser and I'll talk about it, I promise. But um, also remember that you're creating a proper skeleton. Um, your skeleton is um, is your bones of your body. Um, that's what's going to tell your future self where to go and what to do. So if you don't have a proper skeleton, you don't have the strokes telling you you're starting, you're arching, you're ending, your your tops and your bottoms, then of course you're going to get lost in translation. Um, so making sure, I mean, even if you have to add two extra strokes to your skeleton, um, do that because that will be better for you in the long run. But remember, your skeleton is there to be able to kind of tell your future self what to do next. Um, so it's kind of leading you in the next direction. In a sense, it is kind of connecting the dots. Obviously, you're not going to be connecting your strokes. Um, but it's going to be um, telling your future self where to go and how to go. Um, and remember that your transitions are all, if you're curving, you need to continue on with that. Sorry, my hands don't curve that way. You need to continue on with that curve. You can have one curve here and one straight up here. Okay. Um, so a skeleton in your body. Um, uh, to comment on the girls who were saying they were getting a little bit lost in their strokes, um, I would just encourage you if at any point you can't see where you're going to just wipe it off. Um, if, yeah, if the pigment hasn't been sitting on there long enough, um, it might not penetrate as deep, but you can always do a pigment push towards the end. But if at any point you can't see where you're going, get your water wipe or get your dry gauze and just kind of wipe off a little bit. That way you can see where you're going. Also, don't be afraid to um, use your microblade, and this is scary, but you can kind of like brush away the hairs. Kind of move your hairs out of the way. That way you can create a proper stroke. Um, never microblade blind. So if you feel like you're getting lost, do anything you need to do to be able to create that clean picture of where you're going to place the stroke. Yeah, it's hard when people have really coarse hair, but that's when you're just going to kind of have to learn to move out that hair and then place your stroke and then the hair can go back to where it is. Um, I have used, so I have seen some people use um, spoolies and that's totally fine. Just be careful because it could be a really sensitive area um, and when you're brushing with a spoolie it could not be very comfortable. Um, so be careful when using a spoolie. Okay, back to the magic eraser. And I'm, I don't, I don't mean to rush. I just don't want to keep you guys for eight hours. Even though I did say I could, it could I could broadcast live for eight hours. Oh, that's a really long time. 
Um, so the magic eraser. Um, like I was saying, you can um, just don't use it as a handicap. It's going to be there um, to use it. So, um, and there is a post that Kintia put up about the magic eraser if you have more information about it. Um, but if you uh, say you created my stroke like this, my oops stroke, um, I thought I was going to want to go there, but I don't really want to go there anymore, and I don't want it there anymore. Um, what you're going to do is you're going to take your micro swab, and I actually don't have any micro swabs in my kit right now. They're all at my salon. I tried to grab everything that I could remember, but um, we'll just pretend that this is my micro swab. Um, you know, um, you're going to get your little micro swab, and this is within like immediately after to 24 hours after, and it just depends on how quickly this skin will close. Um, if they're using the balm that has method, it has ingredients that's going to help kind of close the skin faster. Um, but I mean, if immediately after to about 24 hours after, um, you can get your micro swab. The word is that we're pretending this is a micro swab. Sorry. Um, you're going to get your micro swab. You're going to get it saturated with your magic eraser. And you're going to just kind of scrub on that area here. You want to make sure you're kind of agitating it. Obviously, you don't want it to um, get so upset that you're, you know, damaging tissue, which you never would. It would be, it would be in, almost impossible. You're just going to kind of scrub and agitate at that stroke that you don't want anymore. Um, the area around the skin will turn a little bit white and sometimes people that freaks people out a little bit um, but if it turns white that means you're using it properly and um, you do want it to kind of turn white and you do kind of want it to kind of get a little bit of a little bit agitated to kind of push out that pigment um, even if it bleeds just a tiny little bit that's actually a little bit good because it could help push out the pigment so you're going to kind of go in and agitate the little stroke. Um, I would be cautious in using the magic eraser on the whole entire brow at the exact same time. I would kind of take it a stroke by stroke basis. Um, so if um, for that, you can kind of use it immediately after to 24 hours after. Um, if, and you're going to, it's, it says that you'll get about 90% removal. Um, and a lot of students text me and they're like, Sarah, um, the pigment's still in there even though I use the magic eraser. Um, and that's completely normal. You might see the pigment in it, but as it starts to heal, it'll continue to kind of push out. Um, and, not, and it has a 90% per, 90 success that it's not going to heal with the pigment in it. Um, and if it does, there's things that we can do about it as well. So don't stress. Um, so that's in your 24 hour range. Um, anywhere from 24 to 72 hours range, depending on if the skin's super closed or not. Um, if your client calls you, you know, those client freak out moments, they're like too big, they're too dark, they're, what did you do to my face? They're too big, they're too dark, help me, help me. Um, and maybe you, I mean, maybe you do want to remove a few extra strokes. Um, up to 72 hours, you're going to have a 70% success rate of removing the pigment. The same way, just going in and kind of agitating that stroke, making sure your micro swab is saturated and scrubbing in that little, that little stroke. Um, if the skin is closed off, um, obviously it's not going to penetrate. It's not going to turn as white as you want it to. Um, that gives you the opportunity, um, it says about three weeks. Um, and again, there's a post that that talks about this more in depth that Kintia did. Um, if it's like three weeks or four weeks, or maybe you know, you're know you fixing someone's bad work, which is really unfortunate, should have gone to you in the first place. Um, but you could actually get a little bowl um, or uh, a little cup, and you could dip your blade physically in the magic eraser and scratch the skin open. And then you can go back in and do your micro swab. And that, that has about, um, I think it said about a 40 to 50% success rate, just depending on obviously their skin types um, and their skin condition and obviously how deep the original technician went or you went. Um, let me check for questions. Oh. Okay, so someone just texted me and said, I'm watching and wondered if the curved blades any different than the CNU. I think I've seen them with the Tina Davies line. Um, curved blade is just a C blade. Um, so in the Tina, Tina Davies line, she does have a C blade and a U blade. It's just called the curved blade or a U blade. So same thing. 
Um, yeah, it's so exciting that we have those desks disposable. They are amazing. Um, and it's also amazing that she's coming to lecture at the conference. I hope you're all are there. Um, let's see, I don't see any more questions. Oh, there you go. Okay. Um, so I hope that answered the questions for your magic eraser. Um, again, I haven't made a video for that, but we can. Um, I would probably just have to create a stroke on someone I didn't want, which is fine. We can do that. <laughs> um, and then the last thing I'm going to talk about, um, is the enhancement session. I know a lot of people asked about, um, and sorry, there's an annoying fly. Of course this happened like right before I started the video, but it's okay. Um, the enhancement session um, or the perfecting session. Uh, I prefer to call it the perfecting session or the enhancement session because to me, um, a touch-up sounds like I'm fixing something and um, I'm generally not fixing my work. So I like to think of it as an enhancement or a perfecting session. Or if you're in the UK, you can call it a top-up because I love the word top-up. Um, but your enhancement sessions um, are just that. Um, you've created your template. You've created your first session. Um, and as you're beginning, I, I think a lot of students are really hard on themselves because they're not getting the retention that they want. Um, but remember that you're just starting and it takes tons and tons and tons of fake skin practice and real human being practice to be able to get that retention. Um, like I said, it was probably like 40 to 50 range until I got my retention coming back every single time and it like I knew that my retention was finally going to be at the point that I wanted it to be and it, that's just I mean it took practice and it took time um, but with your enhancement session um, one question I got asked was um, do I need to pre-draw um, generally no you don't need to pre-draw again unless you don't have any idea where you're going again if you have no idea where you're going and maybe their skin didn't take it um, as well, or maybe, you know, your strokes might not have been deep enough. Um, you can um, you can go ahead and pre-draw again. Definitely, if you have no idea where you're going, pre-draw again. Um, there's nothing worse than, again, uh, microblading blindly or not knowing where you're going. Um, so, yeah, if you need to pre-draw again, go ahead and pre-draw again. Um, the reason I like to think of it as an enhancement session or a perfecting session is because you're just enhancing or you're just perfecting strokes that um, you have already created. So whatever you need to do in that session um, to enhance or to, or to um, perfect. So maybe a stroke didn't, wasn't as dark as you want it to be. So maybe you're gonna go back and add a little bit more pigment to darken it up. Um, or maybe it wasn't as long as you want it to be. Or maybe um, I didn't use enough pressure down towards the bottom, so only like half of my stroke stayed. So I need to lengthen my stroke. Um, or maybe I need to kind of create a little bit more of a curve on one of the strokes. Um, this session is a time that you can do anything to perfect or enhance it. Um, so if you need to go darker, a lot of your clients are going to be a little bit weary to go dark right off the bat even though you know you are the professional and you know what you will recommend. Um, but if they maybe they're going to come back and they're like, yeah, I, I do want to go a little bit darker. Um, you can darken up those strokes. But you're going to be following the same path that you had the first time. You shouldn't be creating new strokes or creating hashtags or crisscrosses in any way. Um, you should be just being able to follow the strokes that you have and just perfecting the ones that need to be perfected. Making them a little bit longer. Maybe they're not as crisp, crisp as you want them to be. Um, I think the biggest thing with healing um, is, of course, proper pressure, and that takes time and practice, um, but I hope with the stretching video um, that it will help you be able to create the stretch, because if you are not holding that skin taut, granted, is your, your strokes probably aren't going to last very long because you're not getting as proper, proper depth as you should be, um, so I hope that helps. Um, so making sure that you have the proper um, strokes. Um, and if you if you went too deep, um, you know, they might blur out a little bit. They might be, because remember, your, your dermal cells are kind of loosey-goosey. They're not tightly packed like my epidermis is. So, um, but maybe she bled a little bit, and so maybe they're not as crisp. So those are some things that you can, so, I mean, ask yourself, is this touch-up, is this client strokes, they kind of bled out a little bit? And, well, did she bleed? 
Was she oily? Um, and did I place my, my strokes too close together? Because if I place my strokes way too close together, um, my client could come back with a powder brow and not necessarily hair strokes, which um, has happened to me when I first when I first started microblading. Um, so there's so many components into heal the results, and um, uh, I asked Jen to kind of touch on that a little bit because I didn't want to take like 18 hours of your time tonight. Um, so that's what I would suggest for your enhancement session. Um, and remember that in a third enhancement session doesn't mean that you did something wrong either. Um, it, I mean, it could be because maybe you didn't go deep enough, but you're just learning. Um, and be honest with your clients. And, you know, just I am just learning. Or, I mean, if I mean, sometimes I do still have some clients who need a third um, enhancement session. Um, their skin didn't take it as readily as uh, my other skins did. Um, is it oily versus dry? Um, the different skin types and different skin tones are all <laughs> are all a little tricky. So someone just asked, what do you do when first session strokes bleed and you are doing a touch up? Would you suggest so looks crisp and not filled in? So I'm kind of confused by that question. Um, what do you do when your first session strokes bleed? So obviously blood, uh, I mean, people bleed. Um, they're human, they have hair, they're, you know, um, they're a human being. So blood isn't necessarily uncommon, but you only want like tiny pinpoints of blood. So if they are pooling at any point, um, then it is too much blood. But if you could kind of clarify that question a little bit, and you were doing a touch-up, would you suggest so it looks crisp and not filled in? Yeah, that's kind of, that, I don't know, that can be a little confusing to me. Could you just text me and let me know what you really mean by that question? Um, but I mean, some of your clients are gonna be bleeders and some of them aren't. It's extremely, extremely normal for that. Let's see, okay. Um, Let's see. If anyone has any more questions, um, go ahead and throw them out to me in like the next minute or two. Um, I didn't talk too much about color um, because I am going to link a video that Monica did about color theory um, that I think some of you might have missed. We posted it back in May. Um, so I'm going to relink that video for you guys to watch and please just make sure not to post any of the videos um, anywhere outside of the Everlasting group because this is just for a continuing education for the students who have already been trained. Um, we went over blade sizes, magic eraser, stretching. I will add, link my stretching video that I made. Um, enhancement sessions, we talked about that. Curving your strokes. Magic racer. Okay, I think we've covered everything. Um, but I would like to thank all of you um, for listening to me ramble on and on. And I hope this was helpful for you. Um, if it wasn't, if there wasn't something that I touched on, please feel free to message me or text me or email me. And um, we can definitely do these webinars again. I think it's a good experience for all of us to be able to kind of brush up on our techniques. Um, in our materials. One thing I would encourage you to do is you have a wealth of knowledge sitting um, in your bedroom or in your kitchen, um, and that's your manual. Um, I, would I would challenge and encourage all of you to go back, pick up your manual and read it. Um, read it cover to cover because it really is an amazing manual. Um, the curriculum that is in it um, is amazing. And if you read it cover to cover, I promise you that some of the questions that we get asked on a daily basis will be completely clear. So I would challenge you to be able to use that manual and use that wealth um, to be able to expand upon your knowledge. Um, of course, um, I'm always here for you. Jen is always here for you. Alyssa is always here for you, and so is Tori. Um, and uh, I would just like to invite all of you and encourage all of you to attend the conference. Um, it's really going to be absolutely amazing. Some of the speakers that they have are like some of my idols, so I'm like all giddy about it. Um, but this is a time to advance in your careers and advance in your knowledge. 
Um, these are, this is a time to be able to learn from those who um, we don't normally get to learn from. I mean, you can't fly to Canada and learn from Tina, and you can't fly um, anywhere out there. You know, you can. Um, but this is all in one location. So I would encourage you to sign up if you haven't done so. If you need more information, let me know. And I'd be happy to provide you with information about the conference. Um, I will be lecturing, Jen will be lecturing, um, it'll be an awesome experience, so I'd encourage you all to be there. Um, please let me know if any of you have any more questions or if something wasn't clear. Um, thank you!